Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, so for those who don't recognize my voice, my name is Jillian McConnell, and I'm the Knowledge Mobilization Lead with Brain Exchange. And the webinar we are very proud to be hosting today is part of a webinar series, the first in fact, on the clinical guidelines on substance use disorder among older adults. And that's being offered in partnership uh, by the Brain Exchange with the Canadian Coalition of Seniors Mental Health, as well as with Be Behavioral Supports Ontario. So a few housekeeping items to address before we get underway with today's presentation. Um, we do suggest that you connect only through the computer, and that means that you should not necessarily be on the phone for this webinar event. Um, there are a few exceptions to that rule, and that would be for those who do, do not have computer speakers or for those that are experiencing some challenges in receiving the audio via computer or through the Internet. then please feel free to join through the teleconference line provided in the instructions. But we do ask that you only use one option for audio, is using both the computer speakers and the telephone will cause feedback or echoing. So I hope that makes sense. Um, on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a Q&A pod or a chat pod, and that's where you can communicate with my colleague Karen Paraj and I during the presentation and where you can send your questions during the Q&A portion. Uh, if you're having technical issues, we ask that you respond back to the flyer or the invite that was emailed to you, and uh, Karen will be able to provide um, some assistance through email. We will be leaving some time at the end of the webinar for Q&A, um, so you will be able to ask your questions at that point, and just ask that you hold your questions for, for until that, um, that time. The presentation itself is being recorded, and the resources and recording of the session will be posted on the Brain Exchange website, um, and additionally, a link will be shared at the end of the session um, at the last page, and you'll see it there. Also, at the end of the webinar, you'll be invited to take part in a survey that can be accessed online. Uh, a link will be posted at the end of the event, and as well as it will be provided to you in an email that you receive along with um, links to the slides and the recording, so you can keep an eye out for that as well. And finally, the webinar today is scheduled to be 60 minutes in length, so our presenter will speak for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have some remaining time, um, 15 minutes or so at the end for some Q&A. Okay, so now that the technical aspects have been taken care of, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter and topic. So the title of today's session is excuse me, the new Canadian guidelines on benzodiazepine receptor agonist use disorder among older adults, and features our presenter, Dr. David Kahn. And Dr. Kahn is the Vice President of Education and Inaugural Director of the Center for Education and Knowledge Exchange at Baycrest. He is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry with the University of Toronto. And he is also the founding co-chair of the Canadian Coalition for Seniors Mental Health, as well as the chair of the Coalition's National Guidelines Project. Dr. Khan is the author or co-author of more than 100 publications and is the co-editor of three textbooks, including Practical Psychiatry in the Long-Term Care Home, a Handbook for Staff. He received the 2005 Canadian Academy of Geriatric Psychiatry Award for Outstanding Contributions to Geriatric Psychiatry in Canada and a Distinguished Service Award from the International Psychogeriatric Association in 2009. Dr. Khan is also a past president of the Canadian Academy of Geriatric Psychiatry, and so we are very pleased and honored to have him with us today. Um, Dr. Khan is such a great contributor to the benefit of, of those that we serve, so we're very fortunate to have him. So Dr. Khan, on behalf of everyone, I welcome you, and I turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much, and it's a real pleasure to um, uh, be able to speak today on uh, the first of our, our new guidelines. There are four altogether, as you'll hear, and there'll be more webinars coming up in, over the next few months. Um, and I wanted to thank all of you for taking the time to join us today, and I see there's a pretty long list from across the country, including some friends and colleagues and a number of people who, who worked on these guidelines. So, um, some disclosures. So, um, to note that the funding for, uh, for these guidelines came from Health Canada's Substance Use and Addictions Program, for which we're very grateful. The working group members on all of the guideline groups were carefully screened for conflict of interest. And the working group members received an honorarium for their work on this project. So um, as an overview of the presentation, some acknowledgments defining substance use disorder, a little bit about substance use among older adults in general, talk about the scope of the guidelines project, and then we'll talk specifically about benzodiazepines and Z drugs, which make up 
the benzodiazepine receptor agonists. We'll talk a bit about the prevalence and patterns of use among older adults and, of course, the guideline recommendations themselves. There are many people to acknowledge as listed on this slide. I won't go into all of them, but particularly at the top, Claire Checklin, project director of our coalition, and Indira Fernandez, project coordinator. And our guideline steering committee, which um, these, these compose the co-chairs for each of the four guidelines. And they're just a wonderful group of individuals from across the country who have um, spent an enormous amount of, of time and energy working on these guidelines. So um, many other organizations to uh, acknowledge, um, particularly the Canadian Center on Substance Use and Addiction and uh, the Behavioral Sports Ontario Substance Use Collaborative. I'd like to thank re the reviewers for these specific guidelines um, that were listed here. And um, to mention that the views expressed herein do not necessarily represent the views of Health Canada. Uh, this is the actual working group for this particular guideline. Um, my co-chair is David Hogan, geriatrician from the University of Calgary, and you'll see the list of, of working group members. I'm deeply grateful for all of them who've done amazing work on, on, on this uh, project. They, they represent a group of, uh, of individuals from different uh, backgrounds and um, from across Canada. So um, this is a, an important document that was released last year by the, the Canadian Centre on um, Substance Use and Addiction, and it's focused on substance use and aging. It's a, a freely available from the CCSA website, and I'd certainly recommend this uh, document. It's a very nice background document and has a lot of useful information and references. It's noted in there that Canadians have several misperceptions when it comes to substance use among older adults. It's, some people don't think it's an issue at all. Others believe it's too late to improve the quality of life of someone who uses substances later in life. Or, for example, well, why try to get someone to quit smoking after 50 years? Isn't the damage already done? So a lot of misperceptions, a lot of useful information in this, in this document. The final chapter, actually, of this document uh, is, is called A Call to Action, and it says that there's a need for increased awareness of substance use in older adults among healthcare providers, caregivers, and older adults. There's a need for more education and training for healthcare professionals and students, a need for guidelines and recommendations, and a need to improve the availability and accessibility of age-specific substance use disorder treatments and individualized care. And, of course, this is a big issue because there often isn't enough research, as, as is often the theme in, in geriatrics. So what about the continuum of prescription uh, medication use? And at the top, we have appropriate use. Uh, at the bottom, we have a use disorder, which we'll define in a minute. And then somewhere in the middle, there's potentially inappropriate use. We sometimes use the term misuse. Uh, where people may not take the medications for uh, the, an appropriate indication or they may not take the dose appropriately or, or the timing, um, or there may even be diversion of medications. Uh, this definitely occurs where uh, people take someone else's medication. So a substance use disorder, as defined in the DSM-5, uh, consists of the 11 particular issues listed on the left-hand side there. And in DSM-4, these were actually two different disorders. Uh, one was called substance abuse, and the other was called substance dependence. Now it's all combined into substance use disorder. And the term abuse is really not used anymore in any way because it's considered pejorative. But um, the, the actual criteria include hazardous use, social and interpersonal problems related to use, neglecting major roles because of use, legal problems, actual symptoms of, of withdrawal on, on uh, stopping or reducing the medication um, or substance, the development of tolerance, um, using larger amounts for longer periods, repeated attempts to quit or control use, uh, spending a lot of time using or trying to get the substance, specific physical or psychological problems related to use, 
and giving up activities because of use. And then the last one, craving, interestingly enough, wasn't actually listed as, as a criterion previously. So um, you actually only need uh, two or more criteria uh, to qualify for a uh, diagnosis of substance use disorder, although the more of these criteria that are met, the more significant or severe the substance use disorder is considered to be. There's been a lot of attention in recent years um, about substance use in older people. This is an editorial from the British Medical Journal, point, Medi British Medical Journal pointing out that um, baby boomers are actually a population at, at very high risk. Um, and part of that reason may be because um, the baby boom generation in the 60s and 70s um, were quite familiar with using uh, drugs and experimented a lot. And so it's considered now that this population, as they're entering into their 70s, um, may be at very high risk. And there's certainly evidence for this as compared to the previous older cohorts of uh, older people. This is um, from The Guardian in the UK, noting that, um, that baby boomers drink and, and drug misuse needs urgent action saying that by 2020, the number of over 50s, which is not so old, of course, receiving treatment for substance misuse problems is expected to double in Europe and treble in the United States. So um, we know that um, there's increased vulnerability among older adults to the effects of substances due to unique physiological, psychological, social, and pharmacological factors. There's the challenge of complex clinical presentations, of course, comorbidities, cognitive impairment, and some, sometimes polysubstance use. And in fact, this is not uncommon. So people with a, a benzodiazepine problem may well also be um, drinking a very significant amount of alcohol or using significant opioids. In general, this is a topic that's been under-identified and understudied. And not surprisingly, there's a considerable degree of stigma at play, both around mental health and addiction issues, and also about aging itself. So this is actually a quiz question for you. This is to keep you awake and energized and involved. So if you just think about your awareness of this issue, whether it's from your clinical work or other involvement or just your general knowledge, what would you say, which substance do you believe is currently causing the most harm to older adults in Canada? Is it alcohol, benzodiazepines, cannabis, opioids, nicotine, or some other substance? And, and thank you all for participating in this. Of course, there's no correct answer. This is simply your, your general sense of this. And this is great. We're really getting lots of people uh, weighing in here. Thank you. Fantastic. So it looks like it looks like we're settling on alcohol as as the substance um, that's causing the most harm in in our amongst our older adults, and um, in second place, benzodiazepines, um, opioids, uh, nicotine, coming in there as well. And interestingly, no one's voted for cannabis yet. So that's, uh, of course, a, a future talk coming up from our cannabis group. Um, but I think the landscape may be changing there. But we are asking, of course, about, about the most harm from any, from any substance. So thanks very much, everyone. That's great. So the scope of this guideline project. Um, so uh, as mentioned earlier, we were f funded by Health Canada to, to create a set of four guidelines. And, the scope of the guideline is the prevention, assessment, and management of substance use disorders among older adults for alcohol, benzodiazepine receptor agonist, cannabis, and opioids. So we have four working groups, each, each of which has been working on, on this particular substance. Although, of course, as mentioned earlier, there's often overlap between these substances. So it's a bit of a, a, a false process to think of them as totally separate. We use um, the GRADE approach for developing these guidelines, and we're not going to talk much about that at the moment, but this is a widely used approach around the world. Um, 
And it results in grading of each recommendation. And for each recommendation, the quality of evidence for each recommendation is established as being either high, moderate, or low. And the strength of each recommendation, strong or weak. And I should note that in the grade process, the strength of each recommendation is not simply based on the quality of evidence. It also takes into account other important factors, such as feasibility of the recommendation, the cost, the potential harm of the intervention or recommendation. And you sort of weigh all this together and then decide whether the recommendation is strong or weak, in addition, of course, to considering the quality of the evidence. Um, our group also decided that for some recommendations, um, where there really isn't a, a lot of empirical evidence, we would use a rating called consensus, which means consensus of our group without a lot of evidence. Um, but we still think that some of those recommendations are important. It's just that they're not things that people study. Uh, for example, you know, how to do a really good comprehensive assessment is not something that someone does a randomized controlled trial of. So um, we felt that this was a useful um, type of recommendation rating as well. Benzodiazepines, so these were first discovered um, back in the 1950s. Um, Leo Sternbach was um, serendipitously actually uh, discovered uh, chlorase epoxide, or Librium, while working for Hoffman La Roche. And so this was uh, the first marketed benzodiazepine, followed a few years later by Valium, or diazepam. And um, these drugs work. So because they work and because they were considered to be um, less dangerous than, than barbiturates or, um, uh, or other tranquilizers that were available at the time, their use skyrocketed very quickly. They are, of course, um, medications that usually end in PAM, PAM, so lorazepam, oxazepam, clonazepam, diazepam, temazepam, etc. And they tend to be prescribed for anxiety, sleep, but also uh, seizures uh, as a muscle relaxant uh, for withdrawal from sedatives um, and uh, for catatonia. There are a number of, of other um, potential indications, but their most common use is for anxiety or insomnia. You'll see an image on the right saying, Mother's Little Helper, and, and the Rolling Stones, uh, one of their songs uh, re related to this idea that this was a, you know, a way of helping um, anxious and overstressed homemakers, um, generally women. And um, even today, as we'll see later, um, uh, women are more often prescribed benzodiazepines than men. So this term BZRAs, or um, benzodiazepine receptor ag agonists, so uh, these include benzodiazepines, but also another group of drugs called Z drugs that work in a similar fashion on the same receptors. Um, and they include zopiclone, or imovane, and zolpidem, or Ambien, um, which are solely prescribed for insomnia. Um, they modulate benzodiazepine subunits uh, as specific agonists of the GABA-A receptor. And here's an image of that. So basically, the benzodiazepines lower the concentration of GABA required to open what's called the GABA-A channel, allowing chloride ions to flow through. Um, and uh, this is the uh, GABA receptor, which is an inhibitory receptor. It's ubiquitous in the central nervous system. Uh, it said that somewhere between 20 and 50 percent of central synapses have GABA receptors. So they're widely distributed, and they have an inhibitory function um, within the brain. Here's another question for you. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the risks here and problems associated with benzodiazepines um, and dead drugs. And so, yeah, which of the following classes of medication are associated with an increased risk of falls among older adults? 
There's antidepressants, benzodiazepines, antipsychotics, NSAIDs, or all of the above. And thank you again for, for weighing in and answering this particular question. So, um, yeah, it looks like um, all of the above is, is winning out with benzodiazepines coming in uh, in second place. Thank you. I think we can end the poll. That's great. Um, and, and the answer is um, all of the above. And this is, um, you can see a study here that shows uh, the odds ratios in terms of development of falls in, in older people. And um, you'll see that, that antipsychotics, benzodiazepines, and antidepressants all actually increase the risk by about the same amount. So the odds ratios are, are around 1.6, interestingly. So I think the interesting thing about this, is, for example, is that benzodiazepines are, are no worse than antidepressants, actually, um, which is a bit of a surprise to people. They think you know, antidepressants are, are really safe in this regard, but it turns out not to be. Um, interestingly enough, non-steroidal anti, anti-inflammatories also increase the risk, but not by as much. So here's a list of, of some of the adverse effects. Sedation, psychomotor impairment, falls, motor vehicle accidents, cognitive impairment, um, delirium, especially on withdrawal. Uh, you can get paradoxical agitation and, of course, dependency. So um, another quiz question. Um, over the past 20 years, the rate of use of benzodiazepines among older adults in Canada has declined, increased, or stayed about the same. Thank you all for voting. Again, really appreciate it. So what we saw there was um, the uh, majority were actually voting for an increase. And um, well, the good news is that actually the rate of use among older adults is steadily declining. Um, here we see over a period of 15 years, um, a study by Simon Davies and colleagues, what it shows is actually a, quite a fairly um, steady decline. Um, you'll see that again, um, females are, are prescribed at a rate much higher than males, and that's persisting. But fortunately, the rate is lowering. Um, uh, still um, a pretty uh, significant number of people um, receiving a benzodiazepine prescription in that given year. I think it looks like overall it's at around 17, 18%. Still very significant numbers. But the good news is, is that I think the, um, the education and the idea that benzodiazepines are not uh, particularly um, uh, useful or great drugs for older adults is, is getting out there into practice. One of the challenges around the scope of these guidelines is that there's a lot of evidence about overuse of benzodiazepines and the idea that they're very harmful, but there's not been an awful lot of studies that really look at actual substance use disorder um, among older adults. This study from Quebec by Voyer and colleagues showed that um, about 10%, 9.5% of older adults taking benzodiazepines actually met DSM criteria for substance dependence. Um, so the majority did not, interestingly enough. is not to say that doesn't mean that they're safe or good, but um, when we actually look at substance use disorder, um, that not, not everyone qualifies for that. Now here um, we see um, more recent seniors usage rates of benzodiazepines from Kaihai, and again, um, what we're seeing here is that benzodiazepine use continuing to decline. Z-drug use, though, looks like it's maybe going up a little bit, just a touch. And this is specific to long-term care homes, where there's a real concern. You'll see um, you know, pretty high rates of use. 
Um, the benzodiazepine rate is declining slowly, a little bit, but it's still hovering there in the high 20% uh, rate. Um, antipsychotic use is coming down slowly as well, very slowly. Um, but the rate of use of antidepressants is really high, up at around 60%. And there's certainly evidence that as we reduce benzodiazepine use, we may increase the use of other medications like antidepressants or um, uh, sometimes um, uh, sedating antipsychotics like quetiapine. And we shouldn't get smug because this study from um, comparing rates of use in the United States, Ontario, and Australia shows where the arrow is that actually our rate of use in Ontario is quite a bit higher than in the other two countries. So we have work to do. Um, a couple of, of uh, case vignettes. These are just from my own practice, and, and I just want to get across the idea that this, is, this area is complicated. So a 67-year-old, and I, I've disguised these cases somewhat, but a 67-year-old single woman, she works part-time as a bookkeeper. She has a long-standing anxiety disorder and a persistent depressive disorder and chronic severe headaches. Um, she's currently on uh, sertraline, an antidepressant, but also clonazepam, 0.5 in the morning, one milligram at bedtime for many years, um, well, well before I saw her. And she also uses large quantities of acetaminophen with codeine, which she buys over the counter, right? This is the very low dose codeine, but if you, if you take enough of them, of them, it's quite a bit of codeine. And um, she has very poor sleep in spite of taking the benzodiazepine. A 75-year-old man who presents with severe major depressive episode with anxious distress, a lot of anxiety, as we often see. He's also developed some agoraphobic symptoms, afraid to leave his home. Um, he had recent successful treatment for carcinoma of the larynx. He hasn't responded well to two antidepressants. He notes that lorazepam helped him a lot during a previous episode, and he'd like to get some. Of note, he drinks about 10 to 12 alcoholic drinks per week. You know, what does the physician do in this circumstance? An 85-year-old Holocaust survivor with a history of severe post-traumatic stress disorder and persistent depression, and early dementia, who's on multiple psychotropic medications, including lorazepam TID, which he's been on for decades, and she insists she can't manage without it. Um, lately, she's become more disinhibited, and she actually steals her husband's lorazepam. Um, so it has to be locked away, but um, a real challenge. There are many challenges. So physicians have different views on these medications, on, on their benefits and risks. And patients tend to have relatively positive feelings about this group of medications because uh, they, they sort of get an immediate effect. You know, you, you feel more relaxed, you get some sleep. They don't necessarily work long term, but um, unlike antidepressants that take weeks to work, these drugs work quickly. And so existing guidelines certainly recommend benzodiazepine use for short periods of time, especially in older adults, but uh, this often contradicts current clinical practice, for example, in the care of people with longstanding mental illness. And as I said before, there's limited literature actually on benzodiazepine use disorder. We know that um, the characteristics of longer-term users include older age, being female, lower income, single, having comorbidities, using short-acting high-potency benzodiazepines, receiving prescriptions from more than one concurrently, not a good idea, um, the uh, volume of the initial or overall benzodiazepine prescriptions, previous use, and dose escalation. And there are factors that contribute that are both prescriber's factors and patient factors. So um, again, for the prescriber, the attitude, the lack of knowledge, perhaps uh, clinical work environment, conflicting patient health priorities, worry about stopping medications started by others, limited knowledge about how to actually stop and support the patient, um, and in particular, inaccessibility to non-pharmacological treatment modalities. And there are patient factors, too, of course, that many patients are very reluctant to stop taking a drug that they perceive as being highly valuable.
So um, we know that there is all sorts of um, recommendations about not using these meds. This is from the, the Beers criteria. Um, they note that you should avoid benzodiazepines. Um, although um, the, the Beers criteria do say that these medications may be appropriate for seizure disorders, REM sleep disorders, benzodiazepine withdrawal, alcohol withdrawal, severe generalized anxiety disorder, or periprocedural anesthesia. They note that Z drugs are really similar to benzos and, and we should avoid them. So um, this is a, a quick summary of, of the actual recommendations from our guidelines. And what you'll see there is the first 11 are in uh, the prevention section, so a lot around prevention. Um, the next four are around assessment and recognition. And um, after that, management of the actual um, substance use disorder. So let's go through these. So long-term use of BZRAs, I'll just call them benzos for short, uh, more than four weeks in older adults should be avoided for most indications because of their minimal efficacy and risk of harm. Older adults have increased sensitivity and decreased ability to metabolize some longer acting agents such as diazepam. Um, all benzos increase the risk of cognitive impairment, delirium, falls, fractures, hospitalizations, and motor vehicle crashes. Alternative management strategies for insomnia, anxiety disorders, and the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia are recommended. And of course, here we're talking about, um, in particular, various forms of psychotherapy, including cognitive behavior therapy. So appropriate first-line non-pharmacological options for the treatment of insomnia and anxiety disorders include cognitive behavior therapies provided in various formats. For example, CBTI, which is CBT for insomnia, includes stimulus control, sleep restriction, progressive muscle relaxation, and sleep hygiene, as well as looking at the particular thoughts a person has related to um, not being able to sleep. So uh, CBT is not just about changing thoughts. It's also about a variety of behavioral approaches that have been shown to be quite effective in helping with insomnia. A BZRA should only be considered in the management of insomnia or anxiety after failing adequate trials of non-pharmacological interventions or safer pharmacological alternatives, or for short-term bridging until more appropriate treatment becomes effective. So there may be a situation, uh, let's say someone has a very severe depression, major depressive disorder, with um, severe anxiety, anxious distress, um, and they're really suffering and really having a great deal of difficulty. Um, and they're not responding initially, perhaps, to a uh, SSRI or SNRI antidepressant, there may be an indication for short-term use of a benzodiazepine. Um, there's still debate about this, and um, clinicians are often in a very difficult situation, I think, um, determining whether or not um, to prescribe a benzo. In general, we are suggesting that they not be used unless they have failed adequate trials of non-pharmacological interventions. An assessment of risk for BZRA use disorder and other potential adverse effects from these agents should be done prior to prescribing. Um, so identified risk factors include older age, female gender, dependent personality, and of course concurrent or previous substance use disorder. If a BZRA is being considered, the older adult should be informed of both the limited benefits and the risks associated with their use, as well as alternatives prior to deciding on a management plan. So this is really critical. So the prescribing clinician um, really needs to take the time and um, emphasize the limited benefits, the fact that, um, uh, that for example, for insomnia, benzodiazepines 
stop working after a while, the effectiveness is, is really quite limited and, um, and tolerance develops. So I, I think often physicians, I think, are either don't take the time or are reluctant, perhaps, to, um, to fully inform the person about, about both the risks and, and the potential benefits. And as with any medication, it's really critical that we take the time to do this. Initiating treatment with a BZRA should be a shared decision between the prescriber and the older adult or their substitute decision maker, if appropriate. And there should be an agreement and understanding on how it's going to be used. And that could be, um, for example, a planned duration of mo no more than two to four weeks and, and monitoring this. So in other words, you, you say to the person, you know, this medication is, is going to help you for a short period of time, but I'm only willing to prescribe it because of these, the side effects, the development of tolerance, et cetera. And I'm preparing the person ahead of time that this is short-term use only. Um, this, I think, is my last quiz question. So it's a simple one, a true or false. So providing an educational brochure for patients without any other intervention can lead to reduced use of benzodiazepines. Thank you for voting on this. Really appreciate it. That's great. Thank you. So we've got about a, a two-thirds, one-third split there. So two-thirds are suggesting this might be true, and a third are suggesting that oh, that doesn't seem very, very likely. Um, so, well, um, this is a, a, a trial by uh, Kara Tannenbaum and colleagues. Um, the reduction of inappropriate benzodiazepine prescriptions among older adults through direct patient education, the Empower Cluster Randomized Trial. And um, so this was a trial, uh, a randomized trial, where um, they took uh, long-term benzodiazepine users, aged 65 to 95, and they were given the Empower tool, which is a remarkably helpful um, brochure, which includes a variety of information on, on the risks as well as the tapering protocol. I think I've got a, an image of it later on in the presentation. But 27% um, who received this education discontinued versus 5% who did not. So quite remarkable. This was the intervention. So um, older adults who are receiving a benzo um, should be educated and provided the opportunity to discuss the ongoing risks and encouraged to take for only short periods of time, uh, monitored during the course of their prescription for evidence of treatment response and effectiveness, current and potential adverse effects, concordance with treatment plan, and the development of a use disorder. They should be supported in stopping the drug, which might require gradual reduction until this continued. Now, that's if they were on the medication for a longer period of time, not a short period of time. Healthcare providers and organizations should consider implementing interventions to decrease inappropriate use. These include medication reviews, prescribing feedback, audits and alerts, multidisciplinary case conferences, and brief education sessions. Regulators, health authorities, and professional organizations should consult with clinical leaders and older adults to develop and implement policies that aim to minimize their use. So this is all aiming at prevention. Um, healthcare institutions, including acute care hospitals and long-term care facilities, should implement protocols that minimize new prescriptions because of the potential for harm and the risk of this leading to long-term use following discharge to the community or other transitions in care. And certainly we see this often, that people are started on a benzodiazepine, particularly during a hospitalization, and then remain on it. We have a recommendation um, about advocacy here, and it's really that we should all advocate for adequate access and funding of effective non-pharmacological alternatives for the management of insomnia, anxiety disorders, and the behavioral symptoms of, of dementia. And um, we all know that finding effective CBT, for example, in a community is not always easy. And um, so we strongly believe that CBT, for example, in various formats should be widely available and funded. 
Now, there are various ways of, of, of um, accessing CBT, including online. Um, and in Britain, for example, um, because of the need for CBT um, in the treatment of depression and anxiety, they have a, a whole national approach to making CBT widely available. So we need that in Canada as well. Clinicians should be aware that they are prescribed more frequently to women and the potential implicit bias that may lead to inappropriate use. So we thought it was important to put this recommendation in to point out um, that there is this discrepancy in um, the rate of use between men and women. There may be different reasons for that, uh, uh, over and above implicit bias. Um, uh, for example, women go to doctors more than men in the first place. But um, we did feel this was important to highlight. All older adults should be asked about concurrent and past consumption of substances that might lead to substance use disorders. Um, during periodic health examination, admissions to facilities or services, perioperative assessments, um, when considering the prescription of a BZRA and its transitions in care. And there are a variety of useful screening tools. This is the severity of dependence scale. It's very simple and I think useful. Um, it can be used specifically for benzodiazepines. Um, screening for multiple substances. Uh, here's an example, the ASSIST uh, tool, which comes from the World Health Organization, actually screens for 10 different substances. Now, clinicians may um, not have the time to do extensive uh, screening, but um, there are some very, very useful tools that are available. And um, simply asking about use in itself can be, an, of course, a vital screen. Healthcare practitioners should be aware of and vigilant um, for the symptoms and signs of substance use disorders. And um, particular attention should be paid to this possibility when assessing common conditions encountered in older adults, such as falls and cognitive impairment. Um, we advocate for a really comprehensive assessment, as, as we would always in caring for older adults, and um, a comprehensive history that's really critical, including all of the details about uh, previous um, benzodiazepine BZRA use. Um, we point out that multiple substance use is common and should be considered and inquired about in all older adults with a use disorder. We also point out that concurrent use with opioids is dangerous and should be um, avoided at all times, as well as the uh, combination of a BZRA with alcohol. When it comes to management recommendations, a person-centered step care approach to enable a gradual withdrawal and discontinuation should be used. So planning and applying a gradual dose reduction scheme, identifying and optimizing alternatives to manage the underlying health issues, developing strategies to minimize acute withdrawal and managing rebound symptoms, and establishing a schedule of, of visits. Um, abrupt discontinuation after intermediate to long-term use um, should be avoided due to the risk of withdrawal symptoms, substance dependence reinforcement, rebound phenomena, and a high likelihood of relapse. There are a variety of um, tools that can be used. Now, here's the recommended tapering schedule, so um, not required for short-term use, four weeks to six months, 10 to 25% of, of the current dose every one to two weeks. Um, with a slower rate at the end, or a slower rate of taper if the person's been on the medication for more than six months. There are a variety of different schedules that you'll see out there, but they're all similar in, in, in general. Management of withdrawal symptoms should be monitored carefully and can be guide, guided by a validated tool. This is a, there's a list of a couple here that are useful. Um, and they should be managed with symptom-driven judicious use of an appropriate BZRA. Regimens involving multiple BZRA should be simplified and converted to a single uh, medication. Um, some people talk about converting to um, a longer half-life uh, medication such as clonazepam. Um, we do not recommend that in older adults. Um, uh, 
some people, though, may favor this approach. We generally don't. Um, and of course, there are um, greater risks with, with um, long half-life uh, benzodiazepines. Um, we say that switching may have a role in certain situations, such as when withdrawal is being hindered by a limited number of available pill strengths, or when alprazolam is the agent dependent or misuse. We strongly recommend psychological interventions such as CBT during efforts to withdraw BZRAs as they can improve the older adults' experiences and increase the likelihood of stopping the BZRA. And this is quite remarkable. If you look at studies, um, the combination use of, of, of various um, f forms of psychological support and CBT demonstrate much greater completion of um, discontinuation um, with the use of um, those additional supportive approaches. Substituting a pharmacologically different drug as a specific intervention to mitigate withdrawal symptoms during gradual dose reduction is not routinely recommended by our group. Um, a number of stu uh, studies have, have been carried out of various medications in the hope that they would reduce the symptoms. Um, I know there are some uh, physicians who, um, in particular, um, will add in gabapentin or pregabalin um, and believe that they can be helpful um, because they do work on the GABA receptor, of course. But um, there isn't strong evidence to support this, although I believe that, uh, and our group ultimately decided not to support that in, as an approach. And then finally, um, Older adults with a BZRA use disorder whose drug use is escalating in spite of medical supervision have failed prior efforts to withdraw, are at high risk of relapse or harm, and are suffer from significant psychopathology should be referred or considered for referral to a specialty addiction or mental health service. I'm going to finish up with some very useful resources, Canadian resources. So this is, there are two sites. Um, that focus on deprescribing. This is deprescribing.org from the team of uh, Dr. Barb Farrell at Briere in Ottawa. Um, I should mention their excellent publication uh, by Potty and Al from 2018 that looks at, at deprescribing, particularly of um, benzodiazepines, BZRAs for insomnia, and the algorithm that you see up here. It's a very useful and well-researched document. I strongly recommend it. Um, and then the other, the Canadian Deprescribing Network, deprescribingnetwork.ca, Dr. Kara Tannenbaum and colleagues, um, and uh, based in Montreal, but um, both national groups of excellent um, colleagues. And the um, Empower tool, uh, this is an image from it, can be found at that website. Um, it really is terrific. I've been using it in practice, and it is quite remarkable how effective it is when you give people this kind of information. There's also mysleepwell.ca, which is a terrific website, which has all sorts of advice and um, help for uh, people who are suffering from insomnia, um, non-pharmacological approaches. Um, this was just published by uh, the Center for Effective Practice. Um, uh, on managing benzodiazepine use in older adults. And it's also a very, very helpful document. And um, it's well worth a look at. For, uh, it can be obtained from the website of the Center for Effective Practice. They actually give numbers here for number needed to harm and number needed to treat, um, as you see at the, on this particular slide. Again, that's the quick summary of all of our recommendations. And um, I'm going to stop there, and I think we've left about 10 minutes for questions. I should mention that um, my, web, my um, email will be up at the end, along with uh, two of my colleagues from the coalition. And uh, if you have questions that you want to send to me by email, I'm perfectly fine with that, because I know we have a lot of people online and uh, only a little bit of time. Thank you very much, Dr. Khan. What an interesting um, review in a very short period of time. So thank you so much for that. I do want to remind people that I've seen a few comments or questions 
um, coming through just a bit the slides, that um, a copy of the slides will be available at the end of this webinar, um, the link. And um, if that's not feasible, or if there's multiple people in the room, or you're not sure how to write it down, or link to it, you can actually just go on the Brain Exchange website, and it will be um, the slides will also be available under this event. So just wanted to get that out real quick. Okay, so to open the forum for questions, as Dr. Khan said, we have about 10 minutes remaining. You can type your question into the chat pod, and we'll try to get to as many as we can with the time that we have left. I do want to make note that in the last few minutes, uh, we're going to be posting a few poll questions as well. So we invite you to answer um, each of those questions, um, as they do help us. Um, as we uh, go on further and to take a look at uh, your responses. Um, so a few questions that have been already uh, posted, so I'm going to get to those first, Dr. Khan. And um, it worked well, actually. You referenced the Sleep Well uh, website. Um, and this person is asking about um, uh, you know, the lack of availability. If, if cognitive behavioral therapy isn't there um, or isn't available, and he said it was uh, especially CBTI, so uh, cognitive and uh, behavioral therapy for insomnia, and the lack of availability um, among you know various locations in the population. Um, what would you say to that re question? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that more and more um, uh, uh, health professionals are actually getting trained in CBTI and how how to deliver it. Um, there are, there are uh, courses available. Um, and um, you can learn about it in many different ways, um, but it's it's still true to say that um, that resources are relatively scarce. There are some some good online resources, and actually mysleepwell.ca links to a lot of those, so I'd strongly recommend that. Um, and I think I think though that um, um, it's not. I mean, it, it, there are skills to be learned, but they're basic behavioral approaches, and I think many clinicians can actually learn the particular skills necessary uh, quite quite quickly and, and incorporate them into our practices. And um, so, you know, part of part of our uh, advocacy here is to is to um, hope that clinicians from across the country um, are, are willing to take different approaches in their care. Of, of patients, um, particularly in, in primary care, and that we can um, all learn the kind of basic skills required um, to support and encourage patients that, you know, uh, dr drugs are a quick fix and they're easy to prescribe on a, on, you know, just you can do it in 30 seconds, but it's not, it's not the way to go in, in mo for most people. <clears throat> Thank you for that. And then just a, another actual um, participant has also commented um, and she mentioned that perhaps for an older population, keeping with the CBT theme, um, is it possible that um, a person-centered approach might be more helpful? And she quoted uh, Rogarian, or Rogarian. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that. Mm. Uh, so I think I think what the person is, is is asking about there is the fact that there are a whole variety of different uh, uh, psychotherapeutic approaches, mm -hmm. and um, you know CBT is just one. Form. It is very uh, popular and has been well studied, and there is really good evidence for its effectiveness in a whole variety of disorders, including actually um, depression itself, anxiety disorders, um, and uh, indeed for insomnia. And um, but there are a whole variety of other approaches, including interpersonal psychotherapies and and uh, dynamic therapies. And it really depends on the person and the kind of issues they present with. So. Um, so I, I don't think any of us are saying that that's the, the sole approach, although for very specific uh, symptoms like insomnia, um, having a highly structured approach like CBTI um, is, is really effective. And it really helps the clinician too, I think, to, to use a very structured approach. A lot of older um, patients actually, I think, do really well with, with the structure uh, as, opposed, as opposed to some open-ended types of psychotherapy. Thank you. <clears throat> and I just want to uh, briefly um, mention, uh, we have Dr. Carrie Lee Cassidy uh, who's joining us. And uh, Carrie Lee, I hope you don't mind me um, quoting you here, but um, she just mentions that um, uh, her the, the 
Fountain of Health, uh, which is the organization that she uh, uh, supports, um, says that they support clinicians to learn basic CBT skills and behavior activation. Um, so perhaps if people are interested in learning more about that, they can go to the Fountain of Health website. So I just wanted to, to add that. To yeah. There. Yes, I would strongly support that, and I'm actually involved in the Fountain of Health uh, with with uh, Dr. Cassidy, and it's a fantastic approach that uh, uses simple, very simple behavioral and CBT approaches to actually give clinicians the tools in their practices to help older adults make changes that are um, uh, Im uh, to improve their health, such as uh, how to exercise more. Um, or, or how to get more socially active, and it's a fantastic, uh, uh, fantastic uh, approach. And the website is, if you just look up Fountain of Health, it's www.fountainofhealth.ca, um, and uh, it's it's a really great approach. Wonderful. So we're going to switch gears a little bit. We've had a few questions with respect to the use of benzodiazepines with um, someone that has been diagnosed with a dementia. So wondering if there are any special considerations for that particular population, and then whether, um, you know, it, would showing them the risks of taking the medication long term be effective in, in those that have a dementia diagnosis, or do you need to alter your strategy a little bit more in those cases? Yeah, for sure. And obviously with cognitive impairments and um, various degrees of, of, uh, of dementia, uh, the approach may well be different. Um, you know, given that benzodiazepines can worsen cognition, we, we tend not to use them. And um, uh, but as you saw earlier on, the rate of use of benzodiazepines in long-term care homes, the majority of, of residents do have dementia, they're still being used. So for the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, um, particularly when they're severe, n you know, again, non-pharmacological approaches are always the, the first thing that we try. And, uh, but when symptoms are really severe or dangerous, uh, medications are sometimes used. And um, a variety of different medications are used, various antidepressants, antipsychotics when uh, the symptoms are really severe or whether they're psychosis. Um, but uh, benzodiazepines are still sometimes used. Um, by and large, we don't recommend them. We would consider them to be a kind of third-line approach where nothing else is, is working and where there is danger or, or where the person's suffering. And um, again, they, they would be used very carefully, very judiciously, and very low dosage. Um, but I think all of us as clinicians, sometimes um, in desperation, will revert to a benzodiazepine in that situation. But our general approach is to avoid benzodiazepines for sure in people with dementia. Um, and of course, we're often working with um, not just the person, but their families or, or substitute decision makers in, in, in looking at the various options, risks, and benefits. Um, but no, that's a, that's a very important point to make that, you know, ob obviously, and obviously our approaches in terms of um, in, 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 informed consent is different in, in individuals with dementia. Yeah, and that was one of the things that actually came up by um one of our participants as well, and she's saying that uh, she's found that sometimes the family is the one that doesn't necessarily want to see the person um, be off the med be taken off the medication, whether that's yeah. valid or not, or, or some some misnomers there, or miscommunications, what have you. So it's certainly having that uh, family discussion, if it's applicable in the cases of someone that has a dementia, might be um, or is. Yeah. He certainly warranted. Yeah, right? and, you know, we'll sometimes see that again. You know, mom's been on uh, lorazepam for the last 28 years, you know, and, and uh, the family, you know, everyone believes that they're helpful, but, you know, we, we have a lot of work to do often in terms of educating and encouraging people that deprescribing is, is, a, is a good route and, uh, you know, we, we can do it slowly and carefully. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> one of the questions that came up uh, initially um, by a participant here, um, Dr. Nagley, I believe, um, and, and he's asking about whether this, um, I guess, review takes into account the, the Z drugs, so those that are um, defined as non-benzodiazepines but have similar effects. Were that, those, that class of drugs considered in this group or in this review, or did you stick specifically to the benzos only? 
No, they're, they, uh, they're definitely included, and uh, that's why we sort of, that's why we use the term BZRA and not just benzodiazepine. Okay. So, you know, we would, we would uh, agree with, uh, with the American Geriatric Society and the Beers criteria that Z drugs are really very similar to benzodiazepines and don't have any particular advantages over them. And, and you know have this, all of the same risks. Um, so yeah, we we um, would include ben, uh, Z drugs along with all of the other benzodiazepines, along with the benzodiazepines. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying that. So unfortunately, um, I think that really leaves us uh, to saying um, time to say goodbye. Um, and this hour went very quickly as I. Uh, guessed it would. Um, I just want to remind people that Dr. Khan has generously uh, made available his email so that uh, I know that there were some questions we just didn't get time uh, to address or maybe you have some questions um, now after hearing this that you'd like to doc talk to Dr. Khan about. And um, so please take advantage of that if, if that suits you. And can, I, can I put that up on the screen? Because I think I'd have to show my slide, right? Sure. We'll see. We'll just let people maybe because I think it was the last slide. Yeah, that had yeah, and I'll and I'll get Karen to do that. I just I think we're just waiting for some people to put a few poll more poll. Excuse me, a few more poll <laughs> questions. If not, people can certainly email us if um, or access the slides, um, and uh, and they can get your email from that. We'd be happy to assist. Well, of um, course, it'll be on the slide. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, of course, I do want to thank you, uh, Dr. Khan. Um, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and we're just so thrilled to finally have these, uh, uh, well, not finally, I guess they came out rather quickly and, and through lots of hard work, but we're just um, thrilled to have uh, this um, review of, um, of the benzodiazepine group taking place and, and certainly to have you share your insight with us. Um, and, and the findings from the review. I think it's really important for the, for the guidelines. Um, I also want to thank um, my colleague uh, from the CCSMH, Indira Fernando, um, for her help with this uh, webinar. Um, I think it's really important uh, to, to have the CCSMH as part of this organization or part of this um, new guideline review. Um, I do want to thank all of our participants uh, for your questions and for your comments. I say this often, but uh, it always makes for a really successful webinar when there's lots of exchange um, and interaction, so much appreciated for that. Um, could, I, could I just say an important sure. point, that is the full guideline uh, will be available shortly on the Coalition's website, and that's also on the last slide. Uh, within a number of weeks, and then over the next few months, the four guidelines will all be coming out, and there'll be webinars on each of them. Thank you for saying that. Yes, so this is the very first of um, the webinar series, and we'll be uh, covering all four um, over the next year or so, a little bit less than a year. So definitely uh, keep your eyes and ears out for more information about that. Um, I'm actually pleased to report that we should be, um, uh, we'll be having the opioid webinar uh, hopefully in September um, of this year, so uh, right after summer holidays and all of that and people are back to a normal schedule. So um, for those that are Brain Exchange members, you'll receive notification in your emails um, with respect to the registration. And if you're not, then keep an eye out on our website. And I know CCSMH will also be um, providing that registration information as well. Um, of course, I want to thank CCSMH and Behavioral Sports Ontario for their financial support for this webinar, as well as the Behavioral Sports Ontario Substance Use Collaborative, which really led to the development or were the catalyst in the development of these best practice guidelines. So I really want to acknowledge their um, contribution to that. Um, just a reminder that you uh, should be able to see um, the link to the slides um, in the screen, and if not, they will be available on the Brain Exchange website as well. And uh, in the next few days or so, um, and the recording will also be made available. So if you have colleagues that, uh, um, well, actually, you should be able to access it soon, um, but an email will be sent out in the next few days. So if you do have colleagues that weren't able to attend today, that they can access the recording. Um, so yeah, that's it for this afternoon. Again, thank you to all of those who participated and to my colleague Karen and Dr. Khan and Indira. Thank you to everyone, um, all of you as well. And have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks.